With the right amount of money, the right amount of skill and the right amount of public support, we can do anything and go anywhere. For the eyes of the world, absolutely incredible. Now look into space. OK, here we go. To the moon and to the planets beyond. Lift off. And we set sail on this new sea to solve these mysteries, to solve them for the good of all mankind. On April 9, 1959, NASA introduced to the world the astronauts selected to pilot Project Mercury, America's first manned space program. Known as the Mercury 7, these men immediately became national heroes, ready to race the Soviet Union to space. Project Mercury's first goal was to put a solo human into Earth orbit, and the first mission assigned to attempt this goal was named Freedom 7. Freedom 7 was America's first foray into human spaceflight, and it came at a rather difficult period in time because three weeks before the launch of Freedom 7, Russia had successfully launched Yuri Gagarin, who became the first human in space. The US was already lagging behind in the space race, giving it a rather negative image internationally, so it really needed uh, a good news story, and Freedom 7 gave it that story. Of the Mercury 7, astronaut Alan Shepard was chosen to become the first American to fly in space. He was to pilot the Mercury Redstone launch vehicle, a hybrid of a US Army ballistic missile and a research and development rocket, modified for human flight. Finally, on May 5, 1961, Al Shepard left Cape Canaveral and led the United States into a new era of manned space exploration. Flight, this is Amino. Go ahead, Amino. All subsystems status green. Roger, Amino. Understand all systems green. In 60 seconds, I'm counting. Two minutes, one minute, I'm counting. Status check, pressurization. Locks tanking. You are go. Order systems. Go. T minus 30 seconds. Mercury capsule. Go. All pre stock dial lights are correct. The ready light is on. T minus 15 seconds. Eject Mercury umbilical. Mercury umbilical clear. Mercury is on. Lights on. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Engine start. Ignition. All right, uh, lift off and the clock has started. This is Freedom 7, reading you loud and clear. The fuel is go 1.2 G, Kevin at 14 PSI. Oxygen is go. All systems are go. Freedom 7 with astronaut Alan B. Shepard reports the fuel system is go. Oxygen go. All systems go. Astronaut Alan B. Shepard is working like a test pilot reporting facts and figures, reporting procedures in the precise engineering manner of a test pilot. Trajectory looks A-OK. -okay. What a beautiful view. Freedom 7's suborbital flight lasted 15 minutes and followed a parabolic trajectory arcing over the Earth's surface to land in the ocean 302 miles downrange. The main scientific objective of Project Mercury was to determine man's capability in the space environment and the conditions under which astronauts would have to work. In contrast to Yuri Gagarin's flight, which was effectively an automated flight, Gagarin had the ability to control the spacecraft but, but didn't. Um, Shepard's flight allowed him to exercise some control over the spacecraft. Pilot reports assuming retro attitude, initiating retro fire sequence. Pilot reports mission very smooth. During the early phase of the mission, he was able to take control of the spacecraft. He was able to fire the attitude control thrusters to control the orientation of the spacecraft. He's going to hand control movements now, switching to manual control of the pitch attitude. So Shepard genuinely took real control of the, of the spacecraft. He wasn't just there for the ride. He wasn't simply baggage. 
After re-entry, the capsule of Freedom 7 landed by parachute in the Atlantic Ocean, with Al Shepard paving the way for every NASA astronaut and manned mission to come. The US were desperate to get into space. With Al Shepard, it was a suborbital flight, but it took an awful lot of courage uh, from him, uh, for the other people involved, and uh, was clearly, you know, when it's right at the beginning like that, it seems so basic now to be sitting on top of what is an intercontinental ballistic missile, basically, and light the blue touch paper run and collect him at the other end. But it was the essential first step to get an American into space, and it worked, and it was a phenomenal achievement for him and the team. You know scientists and engineers are true nerds, so you'll see a lot of nerd stuff on them. <laughs> Julie is Cassini's chief engineer. She's been caring for the intrepid explorer since before it left home and uses a scale model of the spacecraft to demonstrate its capabilities. This is a quarter size model. So this is a quarter size me. Um, I'd like to be this weight, not this height. <laughs> so you start at the top. This is a four meter antenna. It was also designed for radar. So this is the composite infrared spectrophotometer. This is the ultraviolet spectrophotometer. This is the VIMS, visual and infrared. And these are the imaging cameras, the narrow angle and wide angle that are used for the actual photos that you see. So this is the ion and neutral mass spectrometer that is the most important data that we're gonna get in the last few hours. And here's part of the magnetometer instrument, and here's the other half of the magnetometer instrument. The, the trick is, the reason you wanna put it out on a boom is you do not wanna measure the magnetic field of the spacecraft. You wanna measure the magnetic field of Saturn or whatever you're at at the time. Let's see, that's the nuclear battery. I actually sat inside this part during the build. So when I close my eyes and think of Cassini, I actually see the wiring inside the spacecraft and the things switching on and off. And when it goes in, that's, that's what I'm going to see in my mind is the, is the aluminum melting on the structure. Um, I just never thought it would happen. And now it is. Flight director is complete, everything is normal. Copy. The spacecraft has just crossed 10 degrees north latitude, altitude 1,000 miles. In its final fatal kiss, Cassini touched Saturn's atmosphere and then began to burn up. Uh, we are in the atmosphere. Becoming part of the very planet it had got to know so well. At exactly 4.55 and 46 seconds, on Friday the 15th of September, the signal disappeared. So that would be the end of the spacecraft. Project manager off the net. And Cassini, unquestionably one of our most successful missions into space, came to a final spectacular end. It's a 20 year old friend. I can't imagine anything topping that, but we will try for a new mission. <laughs> it's always that way. It's like a death in the family. You know, it's imminent, and, but when it happens, it's the finality of it that really is what you're left with. <laughs> Cheers, Cassini. Cassini may be gone, but its revelations will continue. Results are already starting to emerge from the grand finale orbits. We have found out some things. We've got some hints of other things from the grand finale orbit. Cassini revealed uh, really a surprising picture, something that we did not expect. Uh, really revolutionary results, I think. One of the things that uh, we can probably say is that uh, the rings uh, didn't form uh, together with Saturn. And we could be a step closer to discovering the length of Saturn's day by pinning down the mysterious tilt of its magnetic field. If there is a tilt, it is really small. 
But we need to find that tilt if we're going to work out how long a day on Saturn is. I would think we would probably have a final answer in three to six months. It's mission accomplished. And for us, it was a long, long mission. It was totally appropriate that it was slightly raining here as we walked out, because, you know, I think even the Earth is crying right now. That was a great spacecraft. It did exactly what we asked it to do, all the way to the end. No surprises. Behind me is the Juno spacecraft, basically life-size. It's an enormous spacecraft, close to 70 feet in diameter as it spins around and cartwheels through space. This is one of the largest spacecraft ever made. In Roman mythology, Juno was Jupiter's wife, and only she could see the king's true nature. Juno had the special powers to see through a veil of clouds that Jupiter surrounded himself with to hide his mischief. Juno, the spacecraft has, all these magical instruments to see inside of Jupiter. Juno is kitted out with 29-foot-long solar panels to harvest the sun's energy from half a billion miles away. 200 kilograms of titanium armor protects its fragile electronics. It also boasts a unique array of scientific instruments. So almost all the science instruments on Juno are situated between the solar arrays. So they're on this main deck of the spacecraft. Here you have particle instruments, an ultraviolet camera. That's the microwave radiometer that looks in different wavelengths into Jupiter's atmosphere. There are so many firsts associated with it to be able to explore Jupiter and get that close. It makes me very proud to be part of the team that designed and built that thing. But there was almost a notable absence from Juno's arsenal. So as we come around, you're seeing Juno Cam right here. Juno Cam is the only camera that captures visible light in color on the spacecraft. But at first, NASA told them to leave it behind. And I just said, uh, I just can't imagine going all that way and not having a camera. So we, the team ignored NASA's direction and we kept the camera on anyway. A regular camera was almost deemed an unnecessary luxury. Because Juno's main mission is to peer through the atmosphere, not just take pretty pictures of the cloud tops. What Juno's doing is taking us all inside of Jupiter to see what it's like. We're journeying right to the center and passing by all the, these strange phenomena on the way down. Uh, how how it works? The light from the heavens is coming down here. It hits this big night, four inch mirror, 2.4 meters. The light then goes up and it hits a secondary mirror here. It bounces off that secondary mirror and the secondary mirror sends it down to a hole this big. The hole is about that big, I've been there. <laughs> through the big mirror. The light comes down through the big mirror, it is there, and then in here, the instruments pick it off. They pick off that light from the heavens and they pick off, reflect that light into their own instrument. And so that's the way Hubble works. Hubble was basically designed with the predicate that astronauts would go and replace systems that would become obsolete. As a matter of fact, much of the science that Hubble is doing today was not even imagined when Hubble was originally designed. Hubble is the technological child of NASA's other great late 20th century project, the Space Shuttle. Like a loving parent, the shuttle has looked after Hubble, ferrying equipment to repair and upgrade it. And it's the shuttle that gave birth to Hubble. This is the incredible space shuttle discovery. And it looks like an airplane, but it's so much more. Starting with the main engines. It has three shuttle main engines. And these engines create the powerful thrust that propel the space shuttle from planet Earth to space. 
Each of those engines consumes liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen to combine and produce water and thrust. You then have some big pods in the back. Once we get to orbit, we don't need those main engines anymore, but we do need to maneuver, so we have orbital maneuvering system engines, and those live in those pods on the side. Of course, then you see the wings. The wings are actually useless for most of the mission. Going up into space, uh, we don't use the wings. Only at the very end of the mission, when we glide back through the atmosphere, for the very final bits to be able to land on a runway, uh, do we use those wings. Very important, though, to get back home. And the main part of the shuttle that you see there is actually the payload bay. Uh, there's big doors that open up, and inside is where we carry stuff. It's a space truck. And that's Space Shuttle Discovery. Space Shuttle Discovery uh, is, I think, really a historic bird because it launched the Hubble Space Telescope. Lay up on T minus five minutes and counting. Close and lock your visors and initiate your O2 flow, and you all have a good trip. April 24th, 1990, Space Shuttle Discovery was sitting on the pad at the Kennedy Space Center. The countdown clicks down to zero. Five, four, three, two, one, and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Discovery with the Hubble Space Telescope, our window on the universe. Discovery leapt off the pad to space, and eight and a half minutes later, it was orbiting the Earth, traveling 17,500 miles an hour. Discovery Houston, you have a go to open the doors. The crew in the cabin of Discovery opened the payload bay doors, revealing the Hubble Space Telescope tucked inside. And then the crew grabbed the Hubble and gently lifted it out with the robotic arm, extended it, deployed the solar arrays, and sent it off to do it, its mission of Discovery. Discovery, your goal from umbilical disconnect. From its vantage point in space, freed, from the blurring effects of Earth's atmosphere, Hubble promised at least 10 times greater resolution than its larger ground-based competitors. Astronomers all around the world prepared for the amazing images to come. But they were in for a nasty surprise. More major problems for NASA tonight, and this time it's not a quick fix. The Hubble Space Telescope, which cost a billion and a half dollars, the telescope which was supposed to give scientists 15 years of dramatic new pictures of space, it's broken. Engineers have discovered that the giant telescope has a warped mirror, which means the images sent back to NASA are distorted. After the billions of dollars spent, the first pictures that Hubble beamed down were blurred. An investigation revealed that the outer edge of the main mirror had been made too flat. Astronomers were devastated. This was an awful time for NASA and, and, and astronomers in general. Hubble was showcased as the example of global failure. And it was the truth. Everybody was so terribly uh, embarrassed and depressed. When you look back on it, that was a turning point. That was a point where people could have given up. And there were many that said, let's just give up. We've spent enough already, We've done this, we failed, quit. And there were others, um, visionaries, who said, let's actually fix this problem. We don't know exactly how to do it yet, but let's do that. Um, let's take the harder path and actually make this thing work. And they did. 